This is about. The Way I See It okay. with so Steve Reitmeister. The I'm getting at the long-term investing is, has greatly changed. Well, I should. I'm putting my money where my mouth is. Each week, Steve shares his unique perspective with us on a wide variety of investment and financial topics where he tries to help investors chart the best course toward profits no matter what the market has to offer. Now, when last we met, Steve, in his commentary, beating the pros at their own game, spoke about the important role that institutional investors play in the market and just how they have the greatest ability to influence stock prices given the trillions of dollars that they have to invest. Steve then went on to explain how the pros rely so heavily on earnings estimates to value stocks and make their trading decisions. So to further our understanding of this vital topic, Steve now is going to tackle the next subject, and that is how earnings estimates are created. Mm -hmm. And first off, why don't you start by telling us exactly what is, for those who don't know, an earnings estimate. Right. We, we kind of take it for granted around here that everyone knows what we mean by an earnings estimate because we kind of live and breathe it as a, as a firm. Uh, but uh, it's nothing more than a brokerage analyst saying, here's my projected earnings for a company. And uh, for example, right now uh, there's an analyst at Wachovia who thinks that uh, in 2008 IBM will earn $8.83 per share. And that is a singular earnings estimate for, for a firm. Uh, most uh, brokerage firms will create these estimates uh, going out about two years. So for each of the four quarters in the years and the, the, the years as well. So each quarterly uh, estimate um, exists and, and for the full year as well. So those are uh, examples of earnings estimates. Okay. And, and you said singular estimates. Then there's something, for those who don't right. know, called the consensus estimate. Right. Uh, the consensus estimate, you know, we keep using fancy terms here. Consensus is another way of saying uh, the average of all estimates. And so I put together a slide here, uh, which is from the estimates page. We're going to keep following the IBM story here because okay. uh, it just makes, uh, makes life easy. Uh, so if we take a look at the detailed uh, earnings estimate section from that page, you'll see here that the consensus estimate is $8.76. Mm -hmm. That is comprised of 19 uh, different brokerage firms having an estimate with a high of $9.13 at the high end and at the low end someone is expecting $8.45. If you add up all 19 estimates and divide by 19, that's where you're going to come up with this average of $8.76. That is uh, what a consensus estimate is. I see. All right, so now we're almost done with the dictionary <laughs> portion of today's program. Uh, lastly then, estimate revisions, because we talk about those as well. What are estimate revisions? Right. So if you understand now what an individual estimate and what a consensus estimate is, now it's much easier to understand the idea of an estimate revision. So here again, I put together a couple slides for that. So let's take a look at the estimate revision or the, the change in estimates for an individual estimate. So the slide we're going to take a look at here uh, is also from the estimates page for IBM. And you'll see that on July 21st, uh, Davenport and Company, the analyst there uh, move, uh, revised upwards his estimate from $8.50 to $8.75. That is a positive estimate revision. We like those kind of estimate revisions yes. going in a positive direction. We think that's very po that's very uh, good for the stock price. Obviously, if it was going the other direction, that would be uh, quite a negative. So that's taking a look at it at the individual estimate level. Uh, going to the next slide here, uh, and this is, I think, what some more people are uh, more used to seeing, which is the movement of the consensus over time. So as we establish um, that the current estimate is, a uh, consensus estimate is $8.76. But if we roll back seven days ago, we see that it was $8.71. And we roll back 30 days ago, we see that the estimate for IBM was $8.54. Okay, here again, th this is a positive movement in the direction of the consensus or the average of all the uh, brokerage analysts uh, on IBM. Uh, we go all the way back to 90 days and taking a look at this trend of movement. And in the perfect world, you'd like to see every closer period being higher than the previous one. That, that would be the best picture. But what's even more important is the recency of that movement. So knowing that in the last 30 days, uh, that the estimates have moved that much higher for IBM, that's a very positive indication because the more recent the estimate change, the more potent it is for the future movement of the stock price. Now you say estimates are created from or, or by brokerage analysts. Yes. 
So then what's the actual process that they go through to create those estimates? Yeah. As they say, it takes two to tango. And, and uh, in this case, the, the two parties uh, in the dance are corporate executives uh, and brokerage analysts. And really, to understand how they come out with these estimates, it's really important to understand the motivations that each of these two parties have in the creation of the estimates. And that's what we should take a look at. All right. So what is the motivation, now that you bring it up, of uh, company management right. to create these estimates? All right. Look at this way. What are the two main parts of uh, corporate management uh, compensation? You have salary and you have stock and stock options. Which is the larger of these two? Okay. And I think we all know that the stock and stock option options are the largest part of their compensation. And as well it should be. That means that their motivations to move up the stock price and move up their wealth is aligned with what we want as shareholders. So there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But when you take that into consideration, that corporate executives, they've learned over the years, if they get too, too much of a cheerleader for their firm and they create too lofty of an expectation of what the firm will create as far as earnings, then quite likely they may come in under the estimates too often and what's going to happen when a, uh, when a company misses estimates? The stock price plummets. Okay? It's hurting their own wallet. It's, hurt, it's hurting shareholders' wallets. So they keep doing that quarter after quarter. You can bet that the, um, that the board of directors is going to be asking for their job soon enough. So they've learned by trial and error how important it is to create conservative estimates they put out to the investment community. And then that's handed over to the uh, brokerage analysts. So company managers provide cautiously optimistic outlooks yeah. to analysts. What do analysts do from there then? Uh, and what's their motivation? Right. Their motivation, again, uh, how are they compensated? They're compensated from salary and a bonus. And a lot of the bonuses at the brokerage firms uh, for analysts are tied to the performance of their stock picks. Why, why is it set up that way? Because the brokerage firm, if the clients have success with the stock picks from an analyst, they are more likely to come back to that firm to get more research and make more trades in the future. So here again, it make, that makes sense as well. How good are the analyst stock picks? It should be how they're compensated because it's, it's good for the clients and therefore good for the, for the company. Uh, and so um, the brokerage analyst, they're going to take the information from the corporate executives here, again, which was cautiously optimistic to begin with. Right. They're going to blend that in with other uh, pieces of data they have. They're going to talk to competitors. They're going to talk to customers and vendors and understand the entire picture that's going on for the company. And then from there, they're going to come out with their estimate, which is the one that we generally use uh, for the consensus and things of that nature. They're going to keep con uh, conservative as well because if they make it too high and then they have a buy recommendation on the stock and the stock misses the estimate, it's going to go lower, which hurts their own bonus. So, con cautiously optimistic management hands to cautiously optimistic analysts creates cautiously cautiously optimistic earnings estimates. But and correct me if I'm wrong, if both parties are being conservative, then it would create an artificially low estimate. And so then that begs the question, is the quote unquote surprise really a surprise? Uh, it's a great question. And the answer is uh, no, it's, it's really not. And, and that's why you have a lot of times where a company, um, they hit their numbers or maybe even exceed it by a penny or two. And then it falls afterwards. And we call that, you know, buy on rumors, sell on news, because we all kind of knew that was happening. Uh, if you were to go back 20 years ago, uh, you'd find that most estimates were uh, pretty much in the middle of where things came out. In other words, 50% of companies met or exceeded estimates and 50% came in under. Now that party has moved to about 80% meet or exceed and 20% fail uh, and miss their number. And so the game certainly has shifted. But that's all the more important reason why if a company misses estimates, why here we just keep pounding the table here of why you need to sell that stock right away. So I, I've said this in previous commentary. I, I don't think I can repeat it enough. There's only two reasons for a company to miss estimates. One is that industry conditions have deteriorated so fast that the company couldn't make their growth outlook. The second is that company management was incompetent at some level that they couldn't predict earnings for the company or their strategies for growth are not working out as planned. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do you want your money in a company whose industry is deteriorating? No. Do you want your money in a company whose management does not have your best interest at heart and are not creating conservative enough estimates 
for the investment community or whose growth strategies aren't working? And the answer here is no again. And that's why a negative earnings surprise is reason to sell immediately. And remind us again why estimates are so important. Right. And, and that kind of goes back to almost everything that we've been talking about here, and especially last week's thing about being the pros of their own games. How are, er, uh, how are companies valued? Companies are valued by what is the future, uh, <laughs> what is the value of the future stream of earnings estimates and what am I willing to pay for that today? That's how institutions with their trillions of dollars, that's how most of them go to market and pick out stocks based upon their valuations. And it ties back to earnings. So if I were to make a very simple example and if I said, a company today uh, is, uh, has an earnings estimate of $3. And tomorrow they tell us it's going to be $4 per share. Is that company going to jump in stock price? It's going to jump like crazy. But guess what? The party is not over yet because the trillions of dollars that institutions have to come to market, it takes them two to four weeks to bring that money to accumulate the positions they want. And in general, those companies that have those strong estimate revisions, positive estimate revisions, will continue to see sustained buying pressure for two to four weeks. And that's why you can continue to make money on them. Very interesting indeed. And I have to ask you, since we used the IBM example, do you or does anyone in your family own IBM? Do not. All right. And that's Steve Reitmeister and the way he sees it on how earnings estimates are created. I'm Terry Ruffalo.